uh hello so my name is rajiv and uh, today is the <clears throat> last discussion session for the nptl introductory field structural geology course so today <clears throat> i mean in this discussion session we will be mostly uh, summarizing some conceptual facts that we have learned during the field work and we will solve some multiple choice questions so in regards to the upcoming uh, examination for this course and also some other competitive examinations so we will be dealing with some <clears throat> conceptual questions particularly on structural geology and related to deformation and we will try to understand <clears throat> these questions and then uh, find out the the correct option for each of these questions so we will be dealing with such questions and then after that we will also talk about some or discuss about some other concepts mostly related to the paleo current analysis which is an important part when we are uh, dealing with the deformation of a meta sedimentary unit so paleo current direction is an important i mean estimating the paleo current direction as well as utilizing that fact to analyze the deformation or strain distribution in a region is also important and apart from that we will also <coughs> uh, exercise some conceptual problems related to the rotation of certain planar and linear features and how do we interpret all these things via the stereo net or the stereographic projections so these things all together we will we will wrap up the entire discussion sessions going on for the past 3 weeks and with that uh, with that i will conclude today's session which will be the last discussion of this online structural geology course <clears throat> so let me share my screen okay <clears throat> so so we will be attempting attempting 20 questions related to the the material within this uh, course and we will try to solve these questions understand what they mean now these questions are specifically targeted for undergraduate to basic level postgraduate structural geology these are not so advanced but <clears throat> rather they are very much rudimentary in sense that they are also applicable in the field work that we commonly have observed in the field so i have selected 20 such questions and we will also try to understand the underlying theory of these questions and we will discuss each and every options given what are their importance and why a certain option is correct we will find out that logic and then we will follow on <clears throat> okay so the first question is stated as a bed is overturned if the deep of the axial planar cleavage and the deep of the beds are in they are given following four options number one is the same direction and the bed is steeper number two is the same direction and the cleavage is steeper <clears throat> number three is opposite direction and the bed is steeper and number four is opposite direction and the cleavage is steeper now this is an interesting question because often we see and encounter these things in the field because it is an important realization which we should uh, assimilate in ourselves that 
whenever we are going to the field it is quite often natural not to found or not to find the regional structure that we are interpreting because these structures are so large and often there are several scarcities of the outcrop so therefore whatever outcrop we get we tend to find the relationship the geometrical relationship between linear and planar fabrics and from that we try to estimate what could be the overall or the regional deformational structure of an area so some of these uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, interpretations are already mentioned in the lectures and among that one of such important feature is called as the vergence now vergence is a term that we specifically associate to uh, identify the hinge direction and the limb orientations of folds so vergence by definition is stated as that the vergence is the direction of the apparent movement of the upper long limb with respect to the shorter of an asymmetric fold so this is the definition of vergence and you can see that <clears throat> if this is the enveloping surface this is also marked as the enveloping surface so if this is the enveloping surface this one and this one so this creates the sorry this creates the first order fold or enveloping fold okay so this is the first order fold within which the <clears throat> typical association of folds we are observing these are z folds of course these are z folds and that means that for an anticline or an antiform this this would be the left limb right and it is of course it should be allowed for the apparent shear movement the the sense of shear should be there it should not be like a perfectly symmetrical fold will not be giving us the actual vergence or the degree of degree of vergence that is critical to understand the position of the hinge or the limb and eventually if the fold is overturned or not right so in a sense there should be a sense of shearing or asymmetry present now these are the asymmetric folds right the deflection of the axial surfaces these are the asymmetric second order folds so these are second order folds okay now if you carefully observe if we pass the axial planar cleavage then it automatically creates an angle with the bedding plane if this is the limb 
or we can say the bedding and this is the axial plane then we eventually see this angle right <clears throat> so this angle basically tells us about the position of the limb and the hinge which towards which direction we will get the hinge and this is known as the vergence so it is commonly referred to as the acute angle direction will be the hinge okay now for an overturned fold you can see that if we keep the orientation of these axial planes constant and then rotate the fold or overturn the fold we could see that if this is the deep of the bedding plane and this is the deep of the axial plane right so we could figure out the difference between the angle of deep of this axial plane and the bedding plane or the limb right so in this case this is the deep direction of deep of axial plane and this is the deep of the bed so there is a critical difference in the angle and you can see that in this case it is obvious that the tip of the bed is higher then the axial planar cleavage so following this interpretation we say that option a is correct right which means for an overturned fold the deep of the bedding plane or the limb will be higher than the deep of the axial planar cleavage so this is estimated rather we can say it is analyzed based on the vergence of the fold okay so then coming to the next question now the question says that the relationship between x y and z of deformed pebbles in a conglomerate and the axial plane cystosity s1 is such that on s1 option a x and z of the pebbles will always lie option b is only x of the pebbles will lie option c is y and z of the pebbles always lie and option d is x and y of the pebbles will always uh, lie so this is uh, in fact and we have this uh, condition that x is greater equal to y and greater equal to z 
so this essentially tells us about the flynn diagram three dimensional flynn diagram i mean 3d strain analysis which comes from the uh, three dimensional flynn diagram now in the flynn diagram we have r12 in the y axis and r23 in the x axis in y axis we generally plot ln x by y and in x axis we plot ln y by z or in fact we can also plot just x by y and y by z so in fact we can also discuss that why should we uh, consider using logarithm natural log of uh, this uh, sorry uh, i mean in fact we can also discuss that why should we consider the natural log of these aspect ratios so one of the reason being that whenever we are measuring statistically a large number of data so there could be a very high variation in the uh, values so in some case the values would cluster so uh, close to zero and in fact in other cases where there is huge amount of shear strain is being experienced by the deformed markers the values could go eventually into higher orders so there should there could occur statistically a very large difference in the order of magnitude of the different aspect ratios and therefore to minimize that variance and to clusterize the data for proper interpretation we often use the natural log because while using this logarithm of the values it systematically decreases the scale in the power of 10 so that is why it is very convenient to practically plot the diagram when we have a large number of data that are in very high variance of uh, in their magnitude right but in fact if you have a similar shape similar shaped uh, pebbles uh, in all the three planes x y y z and z x planes and if you could see overall their shapes are not that much uh, varying rather they are showing a similar kind of anisotropy in their ellipticity or similar kind of ellipticity moreover then these log or the natural log could be easily ignored and we can in the in that case we can just use the uh, the the absolute magnitude of this aspect ratios to estimate the strain right okay so in this case for uh, a three dimensional uh, flynn diagram 3d strain analysis using this flynn diagram we al always have this one is to one line sorry what is happening sorry let me share again yeah so in the flynn diagram we have this one is two one line this is the center point and we have this k equal to one and recall that k is represented by r one two minus one by r two three minus one right okay <clears throat> so in this case we have known that this is the constrictional domain and this is the flattening domain and this is the uh, plane strain condition now observe this diagram very carefully so this diagram is from eth zurich okay 
2020 their class material i've used this diagram so you can see that this is a shear zone right and the shear zone in the shear sense is marked in this direction right so this is the shear zone now the shear shear zone is particularly localized in this region where we have a strain gradient now wherever there there is a strain strain gradient and if this is the undeformed samples you could see that while there is a shear drag going on within this uh, sample i mean this rock specimen then you could easily observe that these pebbles are being stretched with progressive strain gradient this is a progressive non coaxial deformation and in this way towards this the amount of strain increases and eventually we see linear fabrics along this plane so this is a very well developed kinematic framework to observe that mostly the shear is localized along this plane right this is the plane of shear and the direction of shear is along this way and if we consider a vertical plane along the display uh, along the direction of shear which is cross cutting the shear plane itself then we will get the displacement plane, uh, displacement plane right so on the displacement plane we could actually observe how much strain has been accommodated by each of these individual markers so it is by convention we therefore consider that if this is the plane of shear then along this plane if this is the direction of shear then along this direction this would be the maximum stretching and perpendicular uh, vertical to this direction this would be minimum stretching because any point orthogonal to the plane of shear would experience the least amount of shearing and any direction lying on the shear plane itself will have some apparent amount of shearing and then of course pa parallel to the shear direction it would experience the maximum shear so in this case if this is the maximum stretching direction then we of course by convention we mark this maximum uh, stretching direction is as x and therefore perpendicular to that direction on the shear plane it would be y and eventually the orthogonal or the vertical direction or the pole of the plane is the z direction so eventually the shear plane itself constructs the foliation plane in the rock so eventually these s1 plane that is the axial planar cystosity it is eventually as it is similar to the shear plane right so therefore any pebble lying on the shear plane or the foliation plane would define the x and y stretching directions of the strain ellipsoid and hence in this case the option d would be correct because the 
x and y will always lie on the collision plane or the shear plane. Right? So therefore we can write it down is that foliation parallel sorry foliation parallel plane xy foliation perpendicular plane x sorry yz sorry not yz um uh, hmm yz and zx maximum stretch along shear direction denoted as So in any shear zone, we follow this convention and very interestingly, if we have to analyze the strain distribution of these shear zones, we will always find a section which is foliation parallel lineation perpendicular or rather, sorry, uh, it is uh, foliation perpendicular lineation parallel in any of the sense you can find these uh, planes so xz plane is the targeted plane which we generally uh, observe so <clears throat> these uh, xz plane you can as you can observe is that it is perpendicular to this xy plane or the foliation plane but it is parallel to the lineation because along the xz surface we have the maximum and the minimum stretching direction eventually it forms the lineation as you have of, of course observed in the lectures of this previous week that means in the rakha mines you have observed those deformed pebbles and in that case the maximum stretching occurred along the xz section so xz section essentially forms the lineations that are useful for analyzing the strain distribution. So foliation perpendicular lineation parallel is the convention that we generally follow to prepare, I mean, not only to prepare thin section, but to observe the markers in orient ourselves in the field and also orient the samples while preparing for uh, different kind of analysis. Okay. So in the third question, it is given that in an area deep of uniformly bedding, uh, deep of uniformly dipping beds and the topographic slope are in the same direction, but beds are gentler. Therefore, by walking down the slope, one encounters, and there are four options given, gradually younger and younger beds. B is initially gradually older and then younger beds. C is initially gradually younger and then older weights and number D is that gradually older and older weights. So it is a simple geo, uh, geomorphological or uh, criteria which is commonly known as the V rule that we use for mapping in structural geology. So let me pause for a minute and let you think what could be the answer and if anyone is interested to share their views they can of course uh, answer the question so think for a minute and if you know the answer or 
if you want to discuss please uh, unmute yourself and try to answer the question okay so first let us draw the different beds So I'm drawing essential uh, in uh, intentionally for the purpose of this question. So consider these are the different beds. Right. And they are dipping, dipping uniformly in a particular direction. just like that so say for example this is bit a b c d and e so if we just join these sides so it is being like a set of bits and you can also find the deep angle just like that so if this is a horizontal line so this is the slope of the bed theta theta is the slope or deep of the bits okay now this is the yonging direction yonging direction means it is stratigraphically these the the lower beds are older so this is the yonging direction that means e is older than D it is older than C B and eventually a now consider a slope which is like this this is Phi Phi is the slope of the topography right 
therefore you can see that the topography cuts these beds in such a way that if we go along this direction so if we just move along this direction we will encounter a then b then c d and eventually e so we will encounter a then b c d and eventually e so younger to older therefore in that sense we can say that we will encounter gradually older beds so this means option d is correct okay <clears throat> So let us move on to the next question, which is a set of cylindrical upright folds superposed by another set of non-coaxial folds. So the axis of the superposed folds at any spot is determined by, there are four options. Number one is fold dihedral angle of the first set of the folds. Second is the fold dihedral angle of the superposed folds. Number three is the intersection of the axial planes of these two sets of folds. And number D is the intersection of the limb of the first fold and the axial plane of the later folds. Okay. So, we know that poles are formed due to compression and in this case essentially like these buckle folds and due to this compression we develop weak planes. which are known as the cystocity plane. And this defines the secondary foliation plane. First generation, secondary, foliation right now <clears throat> when we again fold this in from different direction essentially in a non coaxial manner different orientation of compression we see that the limbs are refolded the axial the S1 is also folded. 
folding of S1 generates the S2 which intersects the refolded limbs of the first generation fold which intersects with the which intersects with the refolded limbs from the first generation fold right so in that case if this is s2 that means the second generation foliation plane and it is intersecting the limb right so this is the limb or the bedding planes and through this intersection we can find that these are the f2 you have already observed these things or you have visualized these things through the week two lectures of this course where we specifically targeted and talked about superbose deformation, axial planar cleavage and the relationship with the bedding, the bedding planes particularly. And from that we have learned that while the, I mean, second generation fold produces these spaced foliation planes or crenulation cleavage, and this crenulation cleavage essentially the crenulation lineation in this case particularly provides the f2 that is the fold axis of the second generation fold so how this second generation fold axis is being produced it essentially is being produced by the folding of the first generation axial planar cleavage so s1 is being refolded and this produces s2 and this S2 while intersecting with the refolded limb, it produces the F2 or the crenulation lineation. Right. So, so if we have the intersection between, so therefore, so therefore, the intersection between, intersection between the limb of the first generation fold and the S2, S2 is the second generation axial planar cleavage will produce the fold axis fold axis F2, right? So again, let me repeat this concept is that for poly deformed terrain or multiply deformed uh, or where there are different episodes of deformation, which are essentially not coaxial, it, can, it, it is essentially non coaxial deformation, right? So non coaxial deformations are the most complex kind of deformations that we generally encounter. And the, in this uh, Ghatshila region, all over there are at least two to three phases deformations uh, heavily imprinted over the metasedimentary unit and we see uh, a lot of signatures of this non coaxial deformation. So the concept is that we have these primary bedding planes which are the uh, primary foliation planes which are the bedding planes, initial sedimentary undeformed terrains, they become folded. The folding of the primary bedding plane produces the first generation foliation plane which is essentially a secondary foliation plane but it is of the first generation so we call it call it as s1 so s1 is the continuous cleavage which is produced because of the folding of the bedding planes 
now these continuous cleavages when they are refolded from different direction of compression or different direction of buckling they produce second generation folds the axial planes itself they get folded and this produces a second generation fold of the of which we see that these uh, traces of these folded s1 surfaces produces these s2 surfaces which are the axial plane of the second generation fold and the axial plane of the second generation fold while it is intersecting with the limb of the first generation fold they will give us the crenulation lineation so the crenulation lineation is essentially the f2 or the second generation fold axis okay so through this we could interpret that option d is correct in this sense Okay, which is basically that the intersection of the limb of the first fold and the axial plane of the later folds. That means the intersection between S2 and the limb L, L1. So intersection between S2 and L1 will produce the F2. Okay. This will produce the second generation foliation, uh, sorry, a second generation fold axis, and this is essentially known as the crenulation lineation. Which is basically Okay. So let me pause here for uh, for a second and if anyone has any doubt please ask and if not then we will move further towards the uh, next question. Okay, so the next question is shearing stress on any two perpendicular planes in a body under stress is option one unequal in magnitude but of same sign, option B is unequal in magnitude but of opposite sign, option C is that equal in magnitude but of opposite sign and option D is equal in magnitude but of same sign, right? So although there was no uh, discussion about the theories of stress and strain in this uh, lecture series but uh, I thought that since it is important to understand how this stress at a point and stress and a surface evolves and since deformation is the direct consequence of this uh, stress magnitudes so I thought to put this question which is essentially important to understand how the stress at a point works. So stress, is, uh, so stress at a point is essentially a tensor. You should remember these things. Whereas stress on a plane or a, on a surface is essentially a vector. So there, there could be two different kinds. So a scalar only has one magnitude and no direction. Vector has one magnitude and a direction. So it is a first order tensor and stress at a point has nine components. Nine component means it has nine components as well as direction of different surface forces. So the body force is resolved into several surface forces which close which closes in a uh, known geometric shape 
So in, in this case, so this is a diagram of a stress at a point, right? So without going into much further details, this is the diagram of different resolved stresses. So these are the principal stresses. So sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz. These are principal axis of stresses. Right? And by convention, we call them as sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, and sigma, sorry, sigma 2, 2, and sigma 3, 3. Now, tau xy tau yz, tau zx, these are the shear components. Okay. And eventually, <clears throat> when a body is at equilibrium this tells us that tau xy is equal to tau yx tau yz is equal to tau zy tau xz is equal to tau zx the values are similar so that means they are of same magnitude and of course they are of same sign otherwise you could easily figure out that if they are not in the same sign the object would ultimately rotate so if they are of, if they are, they are in different directions so the object would rotate and shear so while maintaining the equilibrium position without rotation okay while we keep the rotation out of the scope in that case the shear stresses on perpendicular surfaces, not opposite surfaces, perpendicular surfaces, they should be always in the same direction. So otherwise, uh, or same sign rather, same sign means same direction we, are come, we apply. So without having the same sign and equal magnitude along the mutually perpendicular planes, this, this entire thing would topple. Topple means it would rotate. So, for in an equilibrium stress condition or at a stress and uh, or in case of a stress at a point, these shear stresses on mutually perpendicular planes would be of same magnitude and of same sign. So this is this has to be the convention. So for this case, option D is correct. Specifically, while for stress at a point defining the equilibrium condition that means there is no dynamics involved i mean not dynamics there is no uh, kinematics present in the in the object it is not being translated or rotated in that sense it is in the static condition okay so this is how we resolve stresses at a point surrounding a point okay then the next question is on the ramses classification of fold so the question tells that in a fold, if the curvature of the inner arc is lower than that of the outer arc, then the deep isogon, the deep isogons would, number one, converges towards the inner arc. Option B is diverges towards the inner arc. Option C is remains parallel. And option D is that may converge or diverge. So there is no. I mean, it is either one of those.
okay so let us first discuss what is a deep isogon so it is essentially an imaginary line joining the equal inclination points along the upper and lower bounding surfaces of a folded layer okay so this is a definition of deep isogon now easily you can observe that if we have less curvature okay less curvature would mean that lesser deep amount lesser curvature would mean lesser deep amount and lesser deep amount means points of equal inclination are more spread whereas for steeper curvature for steeper curvature we will have higher deep amount and that would means the points of equal inclination are less spread therefore if we have and therefore according to the question the outer arc outer arc has higher curvature so if this is the case so if this is the outer arc curvature of the outer arc and curvature of the inner arc then definitely if this is the central point sorry so if this is the central point sorry this is black so therefore by joining these equal inclination points we will see that the deep isogons are diverging 
right which is actually we see in the class 3 folds so in class 3 folds we see that the curvature of the outer arc is higher than the curvature of the inner arc and therefore in that case we will have these so whenever we are connecting the deep isogons from the outer arc to the inner arc we see that these deep isogons will eventually diverge so that means that option d is so option sorry b is correct option b is correct that means that the deep isogons diverge towards the inner arc okay so option b is the correct answer and in for ramses classification we see these in class 3 folds okay So let us move on to the next question. So the seventh question says that which one of which one of the following sets of structure is useful in deciphering the sense of shearing in a ductile shear zone? Option A is vein arrays, syntaxial vein and boudins. Symmetrical folds, hinge lines of the folds and the axial foliation folds. Granulation foliation, uh, granulation foliation, space cleavage and axial plane foliation. And option D is extension, granulation, foliation, SC myelinetic foliation and mica fish. Now, these, <clears throat> these kind of answers could be uh answered in both in two different ways one is knowing the definitive answer or through eliminating the impossible options or the improbable op uh, improbable options right so as you can see that the first option is not correct because boudins are specifically observed in uh, dilational deformation that means where is there is tension right so a sense of tension or a pure shear component is essential for forming these boudins so for a ductile shear zone, we do not consider boudins to uh, use them as classical uh, shear sense indicators, right? Because although boudins can be imbricated in different ways, so there can also some there can also be a possibility of imbricated boudins like this. In that case, this might produce a sense of shear, but that is very rare. So generally, we do not consider boudins as a classical strain markers. And then symmetrical folds is not is definitely not a shear sense indicator because where there is a sense of shear, whether sinistral or dextral, there should always be an asymmetry related to this kind of uh, folds so asymmetric folds are the ideal kind of shear sense, in, shear sense indicators for uh, a ductile shear zone and you have also observed these kind of things in the week three lectures where we have visited the rakha mines and we have seen the small scale signatures of ductile shear zones where there were asymmetric folds reclined folds to be specific reclined asymmetric folds are robust indicators or uh, of shear sense in a ductile shear zone 
Granulation foliation, this option is vaguely represented because eventually granulation can also provide information about the shear sense in shear, direction of shear, but there should be some asymmetry present in the granulation. For a symmetric, uh, symmetrically folded, uh, I mean symmetrically refolded fold would produce symmetric granulation similar to their first order or first generation fold. And therefore, granulation can be either uh, symmetric or asymmetric. So asymmetric granulation in this case would be a shear sense indicator. Then coming to the last point, we see this SC myelinetic fabric and mica fish. So mica fish is like this kind of structure. Mica grains are folded. Uh, I mean, they are uh, dilated and deformed in such a way that it produces a sense of shear. So mica fish are excellent indicators of these uh, shear sense, but myelinetic fabric, SC fabric is essentially an indicate, uh, an important component for under understanding the shear uh, deformation. So <clears throat> the shear, so the foliation, so, so this, the primary foliation planes or the S1 due to the drag of the shear or, or due to shearing, they would eventually be shaped like this. So the primary, sorry, but, but the S1 planes basically or the S surfaces, they produce this asymmetric shape and this is called as the S fabric, whereas the shear plane itself along which this shear is uh, taking place, this is called as the C fabric. So these planes eventually they produce this C fabric. So C fabric is often visible where there are multiple uh, conjunction of these different layers of S fabrics and they eventually concatenate at a place and with their high density at these uh, along these shear planes we could eventually see these C planes. So C planes are ideally the shear planes along which the shearing is taking place right and in the and of course while we have while we are trying to observe this C fabric we need to have the exit section again. So exit sections are the important sections through which we can study the kinematic strain indicator, I mean the kinematic indi indicators such as these SNC planes to understand the sense of shear and also the amount of shear that took place. So this SC fabric is only visible if we cut a plane which is perpendicular to the foliation plane. So if this is the shear plane, right? Shear plane is the C plane. So this is the shear plane and we are cutting the shear plane perpendicularly like this or a vertical section. So fo foliation perpendicular and of course the shear direction is the X direction. So along X direction we will have maximum stretching and this is the Z direction which has the minimum stretching. So therefore we have the exit profile of the strain ellipsoid along this plane on the vertical section, right? So the SC fabric altogether is visible on the exit section of the uh, profile of the rock surface. And eventually we can also see these mica fishes, mica fish structure. These are microstructures, of course.
So these microstructures are also visible along the XZ plane. Okay. So together with these granulation, sorry, uh, extension granulation is also a kind of uh, that was talking about the asymmetric granulations. These are uh, extension granulation along with this SC myelinating fabric and the mica fish. So these are the robust shear sense indicator that we commonly encounter in a ductile shear zone. Okay, so we utilize these facts and also these angle between the S and the C fabric tells us the orientation of these stretching axis and the sense of shear can be calculated from these as well. So in this case, we can say that option D is correct. Okay, so SC fabric along with asymmetric porphyrio clast or porphyrio blast structures are the robust indicators of shear sense. Okay. So the next question is, a rock mass in an area is faulted. The fault surface shows slick sides. If the rake of slick sides is zero, then the fault is Fault is a gravity fault, thrust fault, strike slip fault, and growth faults, right? So this would actually be the slick and lines, not sides. Slick and sides is the surface, and slick and lines are the lineations produced due to the scratching effect or the roughness generated on the shear faults. <clears throat> so these are the effects of shear surface roughness on the fault, fault planes that, that produces these slick and sides and slick and lines kind of structure. So obviously you have studied or at least in these lecture videos you have observed the brittle deformation features and also the slick and lines and slick and sides in many different exposures in the Ghatshila region, in and around Ghatshila region. So if this is the hanging wall section, sorry, if this is the foot wall section,
so if this is the if this is an hypothetical normal fault so it would be producing slick and lines like this right so therefore if we zoom this surface we see that the rake of the rake of the slick and lines provides the direction of net slip along a fault surface or fault plane right so for this kind of fault this is an oblique normal fault right so oblique means there are two components one is strike slip component which is the direction parallel to the strike of the fault plane and the another one is the deep slip component right <clears throat> the direction parallel to the deep direction of plane so the different categories of rake we can have of course theta is equal to 0 theta is equal to 90 and theta which is within the range right so when there is i mean pure strike slip fault So pure strike slip fault means no deep component. Rake is equal to 90 degree means pure deep slip fault with 
no strike component. And this is called net slip fault, sorry, oblique slip fault. both strike and deep component. Right? So here we see that the rake of the silicon lines is zero degrees. Then of course it means that we have a pure strike slip fault. That is why there is no deep component. So in this case, option C is the correct answer. Okay. So question number nine says that which of the following cannot be used as a shear sense indicator? Option A, mica fish. Option B, V pull apart. Option C is uh, X type porphyritic clusts. And option D is quartz axis LPO. That is lattice preferred orientation pattern. Right. So this is of course a shear sense indicator. Now talking about V pull apart. So these are trans tensional structures. Trans tensional stresses and overall asymmetric, therefore, the <coughs> sense of asymmetry. provides uh, direction of shear, right? Now then coming to quartz LPO, lattice preferred orientation. So lattice prepared orientation occurs when suppose say for example this is your undeformed quartz grain. Now undeformed grains will have different orientation of crystal lattice. I mean the C axis of this quartz will be randomly oriented. Right? Now, similarly, when you deform this entire packet, this quartz grain will be, not only they will pre develop a SPO, that is shape preferred orientation, but also their crystal lattice, I mean the C axis would also point along a specific direction. So this is called lattice preferred orientation.
in many cases it is called cpo crystallographic preferred orientation and this is a measure of intensity of crystal plastic deformation right and the change in shape with overall microstructure is known as SPO shape preferred orientation so there are two different things of anisotropy the to its changes in microstructure whereas this lpo or the cpo it tells us about the inherent crystal plastic deformation mechanism taking place within individual mineral phases that tells us about the intensity of the crystal plastic deformation mechanisms taking place so therefore by elimination we could see that this is the only option remaining which we cannot explain through our logics and therefore this is the correct option so this is this is the other way to solve uh, uh, solve an mcq question right in some cases we do know the answer which is the definitive approach we already know which option is the correct one in other sense we eliminate through logic and the remaining option would definitely be in the correct case and because the option itself i mean the question itself states which cannot be used as a shared sense indicator so this kind of false positive sense questions is very common in uh, examinations like jam and gate so be careful about what these kind of questions are telling and answer accordingly it is often seen that students get confused about the question without reading it properly and they try to answer and they uh, i mean answer the exactly opposite thing that has been asked in the question so to avoid this first read the questions very carefully and if you don't know the definitive answer then definitely take the elimination approach take some time think about the question think about the different options eliminate them and the remaining one will generally be the correct answer okay okay so the next question is the maximum curvature of a cylindrically folded surface occurs at four different options have been given axial plane fold axis hinge and limb so it is very easy to answer so if you can just draw a fold so fold is like a wave right so this is the amplitude this is the wavelength and therefore of course these are the inflection points so inflection points are the points where the curvature the sense of curvature changes so of course these are the imaginary points so 
so imaginary points on the limbs denoting the change of the sense of curvature and of course there are hinge so hinge is another point hinge is also a point demarcating the change in <coughs> curvature and hinge has maximum curvature in a cylindrically folded surface so option c is correct okay number 11 says that an open fold may appear to be isoclinal when viewed from viewed in a section which are option a at a low angle to the fold axis option b is at 45 degrees to the fold axis option c is the perpendicular to the fold axis and option d is parallel to the fold axial plane right so open fold means it will have very gentle curvature and the opening will be very large generally obtuse angles that is 120 degrees or more so this is the structure of a of an open fold right okay so this is an open fold now the question is that these are the limbs this is the axial plane and definitely this is the fold axis now any section parallel to the axial plane so if we cut a section parallel to the axial plane what we will what will we see the trace of the bedding plane right like this and since the fold is assuming the fold is cylindrical that means it would give us these horizontal bedding planes like this horizontal sections so this is section parallel to axial plane so this is not the definitely the answer now perpendicular to the fold axis means the profile plane so this is the profile plane which means perpendicular to the fold axis
So in this profile plane, we can see that the fold is already open fold. So there is no denying of the fact that uh, open, the, any section perpendicular to the fold axis would represent any isoclinal view. Now keep in mind that isoclinal fold means the deep of these two limbs would be the same or in, in, a, in a very close range, right? So that is what we define as isoclinal folds. Now, <clears throat> this also not the correct option. At 45 degrees to the fold axis, that means if we have a section which is at 45 degrees to the fold axis means somewhat like this. So if this is 45 degree, so we cut a section like this. So any section that would be cut like this. would seem like an asymmetric open fold. And definitely not isoclinal. So this is also not, a, not the correct option. Then definitely option A is the right answer. Which is at a low angle to the fold axis. And definitely low angle means very low. That means along say 10 degrees or so. So any section cut along this section, not exactly parallel to the axial plane, but since we will have a low angle, then it would cut both of the limbs in such a way that it would generally produce one, I mean, steeper sections. So if you cut something along this way, the projection would be very much steeper. So in a sense, we would not be able to observe the exact deep amounts but we will see steeper projections of these beds in both both directions and therefore it would seem like it is an isoclinal fold so so the project projection might look like this so in this way so this means an isoclinal view So this may produce an isoclinal projection of these folds. But keep in mind that these are the not actually isoclinal. It is open, but at a low angle, very low angle to the fold axis, any section cut would project the beds steeper than they are actually. And in that case, we will have an isoclinal view. OK, so there is then this numerical question. It tells that a dipping limestone bed with a true width of 5 meter shows an apparent width of 10 meter on a horizontal surface. Calculate the true deep of the limestone bed and the options are 70 degrees, 50 degrees, 30 degrees and 10 degrees. So let me pause here for a minute and eventually give you some time to think what could be the approach and then I will also discuss this thing later. <clears throat> now these kind of problems are very uh, very common in any kind of ex uh, competitive examinations gate jam gsi they often i mean at least one question would be there which is similar to this kind of geometrical problems related to structural geology and these are nothing but very simple trigonometry there are not so much complexities are involved So what it tells is that we have a horizontal surface. Right? And then we have 
बेट like this so this is the horizontal surface limestone bed this is now this is the deep of the limestone bed which is theta and this is the apparent width of the limestone bed which is 10 meters right now this is the true width sorry because true width is always calculated orthogonally along the layers so this is 90 degree and this is theta right and this is the true thickness true width five meters then simply we have to calculate what is the deep amount so we can see that sine theta is true width by apparent width that means 5 divided by 10 which is half therefore theta is equal to sine inverse half and sine inverse half means it is 30 degrees so the deep amount is 30. hence option c is the correct answer 30 degrees okay Now moving on to the next question. This is also another analytical, I mean mathematical question. So we have 20 questions. So I guess uh, it will take the entire time to answer these uh, questions. So this question says that the deep of a fault is 200 meters and the deep amount is 30 degrees. The throw of the fault is in meters given 300, 200, 100 and 50. Now these diagrams specifically talks about the different geometrical aspects of a fault plane. So here you can see this is the net slip direction. This is the strike slip component. D is the deep slip component and this is the net slip. This is the hanging wall. This is the foot wall and of course this is the fault plane itself. Now there are two different things on the foot wall projected like this. So if this is the foot wall, so if you observe from this view, So we see that there is an elevation gap.
right? <clears throat> this elevation gap or this vertical gap, vertical displacement is known as the throw. This is known as throw, right? And then there is a horizontal displacement as well. So from this point, we see that this is moved along this direction. So this is called the horizontal displacement. This is called heave. And then there is this much amount. This is the deep slip amount. Right. So therefore, if you just draw a triangle, So then this is throw, this is deep slip, and this is heave. Theta is the deep of the fault plane. Then we can of course see that the relation is sine theta is equal to throw by deep slip. Now in this case we have the deep amount is 30 degree and the fault deep of the fault that means the deep slip amount is 200 meter. So sine 30 is equal to throw divided by 200. That means throw is half of 200, which is 100 meter. And therefore, option C is the correct answer. Okay. <clears throat> A single slice of rock bound by thrust falls on all sides is called. This is, of course, you can see that this is a thrust fault here, here, here. So these are thrust faults. And a rock surface is exposed in this way. It is called as pop-up structure. So this is option B known as pop-up structure. So pop-up structures occur when the thrust, I mean a single slice is uh, surrounded by thrusts and the rock is elevated from its normal elevation level because of this reverse thrusting. I mean because of this thrusting and this is generally seen as pop-up. And the consecutive, so if there is a pop up, then definitely there would be some pop down. I mean, some because it is a relative motion, right? So if something is going up, then with respect to that, something will all eventually go down. There will be an elevation drop. Since there is an elevation 
uh, rise there will be automatically a uh, elevation drop so this elevation drop this kind of structure it is called as pop down okay another thing on the strike slip fault a strike slip dip fault strikes 30 degree north and dips 45 degree southeast the net slip of the fault plunges there are several options given first is 30 degree towards 45 degree north then it is 0 degree towards 30 degree north then it is 45 degree towards 120 degree north and then eventually 90 degrees towards 30 degree north by definition of strike slip fault we have seen in the previous uh, question that the strike slip fault will have zero degree of um, plunge or rake whatever right so for strike slip fault let me draw it with different color So if this is a strike slip fault, This is the net slip direction, right? <clears throat> so there will be no plunge of the net. Uh, I mean, there will be no plunge of the net slip because in this case, net slip will be parallel to the strike of the fault hence there will be no plunge So option B is correct, 0 degree towards 30 degree north, right, okay. This one is a good question. Examine the given geological section which contains sedimentary succession interrupted by a dike and which contains no tectonic disturbances. So this question particularly is about the sequence of events. It has been specifically stated that there are no tectonic discontinuities present. Then the first question is how many unconformities can be identified in the section? And then the second question is which of the following contacts is an unconformity? From the given option, you have to select which is actually an unconformity. So unconformity is basically defined in terms of sedimentary, sedimentary geology or stratigraphy. It is defined as a plane of non-deposition followed by subsequent erosion and which is defined through uh, irregular geometry and 
depicting a hiatus in or a lag in the static graphic sequence and it basically represents a large amount of time gap between two successive uh, or two consecutive layers of rocks so given that there can be four different kinds of no, unconformities So one is non-conformity, which is contact between sedimentary and non-sedimentary rock. So one unit definitely sedimentary like this. And this one can either be igneous or metamorphic. Okay. Then comes the angular unconformity. contact interface with variably oriented surfaces. Disconformity is really denotes a very rough surface. And long gap. Whereas paraconformity small range time lag between sedimentary units, successive sedimentary units. So this is known as paraconformity. So therefore, by observing these kind of contexts, non-conformity, angular unconformity, disconformity, and or paraconformity, and therefore by applying these rules, we can say that see there is a granite nice in the map. So this is a metamorphic rock and top of that there is a red sandstone. This is a sedimentary rock. Right? So the, sed the contact between a non-sedimentary rock and a sedimentary rock definitely indicates time gap because it definitely indicates a shift of the environment. right? Whereas a metamorphic rock, it definitely has to come up after that it acts as a abyssal plane and then eventually there is a deposition of this sedimentary rock. So this kind of process takes place and which, I mean, definitely there should be a time gap or time lag between these two things. So this is, so this is one such unconformity one. And then again, these surface. This is an oblique surface, right? 
so this is number two oblique surface means variably oriented layers and the interface between them is an unconformity and definitely this one as well so we have non-conformity and angular unconformity So together we see that this is the correct answer. And from the given options below, we can see that granite nice and red sandstone contact is a correct option for unconformity. Because apart from these, there are all the orient, I mean the sequences are between sedimentary rocks, but this one Although the other options could be a possible unconformity, but we have to see when we are talking about a multiple choice question, we have to select the most probable one. So granite nice and red sandstone contact is definitely a unconformity. The other the other contacts are questionable, but it is not questionable. It is definitely an unconformity. So that is why it is the correct answer. Okay. Now is cyst represent a material which has mechanical properties. So therefore, we learned that cystosity develops due to shearing and represents mechanical anisotropy. So therefore, definitely it has to be within these two options and ceased planes or foliation planes are generally developed with micaceous minerals therefore compositionally and mechanically homo homogeneous So option B is correct, homogeneous and anisotropic. Okay, <clears throat> number 18 is quite easy. Heave is generally the horizontal displacement between hanging wall and the foot wall. So this is the correct option we discussed earlier. Then coming to Question number 19, which says that high angle of intersection between bed and foliation indicates limb of a recumbent fold, limb of a tight fold, hinge of a fold, and definitely limb of an open fold. So if we consider a fold like this, right so this is the axial plane of the fold
and these are the traces of axial planar cleavage. right then of course you can see that towards from hinge to limb intersection angle decreases right in both directions but in this point this is axial plane and this is the bedding. We have perfect perpendicular intersection. So therefore, high angle of intersection between bed and foliation indicates this would be option C, which is hinge of a fold. And in fact, in fact, this is an identifying criteria to locate the hinge of a large fold or a regional fold. You have also seen these things in the lectures as well, where we were discussing the fold outcrops in Ferryghat and we eventually saw that at the hinge of the folds the axial planar cleavages are almost perpendicular to the bedding planes. So this is of course an identifying criteria to locate and eventually map the entire regional folds through these small scale observations. Now the final question is that symmetric boudinage, symmetric boudinage is usually produced by extension of a competent layer embedded in a in an incompetent matrix. Okay, and chocolate tablet structures is the result of a defor deformation where the bulk finite strain ellipsoid shape or the k value is given by there are four options: k is equal to one, k less than one, k greater than one, and undefined value of k. Now, simply this kind of structures are called chocolate strap, chocolate tablet structures. You can see, of course, and they definitely represent a flattening type strain. Now, flattening type strain occurs. So, this is the k is equal to 1 line. This is the k is equal to infinity line and this is the k is equal to 0 line. So, this domain denies, uh, denotes uh, 1 greater than k greater than 0 this. So, therefore, chocolate tablet structures occurs within this flattening range and eventually we can say that therefore, B K less than one is the correct answer. Okay, so with that, we eventually end today's discussion session. So if anyone has any question, please ask and we can have a discussion about any doubt. So any doubt regarding today's discussion session, any kind of question you have. So this is the last discussion session of this course. So we will have questions. I mean, the examination is coming uh, in the end of the October, I presume. So prepare well and follow the course materials, specifically the lectures. And you can also refer to another course, which is structural geology in PTL structural geology course taken by Professor Shantanu Misro. And that that deals with more of a theoretical approach. This course is specifically for the field structural geology, and that is the entire domain of theoretical and practical structural geologies.
uh, so you sh i also encourage you to enroll to that course because that comprehensively con uh, <clears throat> concludes every aspect of structural geology starting from stress to strain brittle and ductile deformation poly deformation phases practical aspects of structural geology everything and apart from that so today is the last discussion session and we discussed 20 such uh, conceptual multiple choice questions because in your examination you will also be having mcqs with some numerical type questions as well so if there are any doubt please let us know we can also use the discussion forum of the course platform we will have discussions there as well and then if there is no question from you guys so let me close this meeting and i wish you all the best for the upcoming examination for this course thank you